But let's go. Everybody ready? Let's go. Let's get a 10-minute game in. And let's see who the field will give us today. 1805. Okay. So we've been playing D4 for the last couple of games. I want to explore positional themes a little bit more uh, today. Um, I'm, I'm in a positional mood for some reason. Now, we're going to play the main lines. We're not going to play the London. We're going to play D4 and C4. And we have another King's Indian slash Grunfeld. So, you know, as per usual, we're going to play Knight C3. And he plays the King's Indian. Now, yesterday we faced uh, the Grunfeld. We faced D5 in this position. Bishop G7 is the entrance to the King's Indian because black allows white to play E4. And D6 main line. Now, there's a thousand variations that we could play in the King's Indian. The one that I have historically chosen um, in the speedrun is the Samish, which is the move F3, which is widely considered to be the most tactical line of the King's Indian. Uh, and for, you know, against players in the 18, 1900 range, it presents a great deal of challenges because it's usually not as well studied by players. Um, but we don't have to play the same-ish today. Um, and I can introduce you guys to, let's just say, another line. And what I want to play today is something called the Aberback Variation. And I want to explore, I want to branch out. And the Aberback Variation starts by playing bishop to e2. So this is a bit of an awkward looking move if you're developing the bishop first. And the move knight f3 transposes to the classical variation, which is also considered the main line. But we're going to play bishop g5. Um, and this is the Aberback. And in the Aberback, you develop both of the bishops before this knight, which has, and I'm not a big Aberback expert. It's not like I know exactly what to do with white. Um, but it's a very flexible opening because by refraining from developing this knight, you are opening uh, up the possibility of a quick kingside attack. You can actually go h4 in this position. And with the contact of the h5 square unobstructed by the knight, you're going to be threatening a quick h5. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to play this traditionally and play h4 in this position. He plays h6. Now, why, you might ask, are we putting the bishop on g5 if it's very easy to chase away? So what's the explanation for that? Why didn't we straight away put the bishop on e3? Why allow h6? Yeah, we want to induce a weakness. Um, and not only do we want to induce a weakness, this is a hook. After we play h5 and he plays g5, the f5 square might be very weak. So there's a lot of reasons for uh, inducing a move like h6. All right. Um, so he goes e5. Now, those of you who've played the King's Indian a good amount, um, you know, you should know. One second. Okay, so let's see. Should we close the center? Should we take? We should absolutely close the center. Since we're attacking on the king's side, we should close up the center so that we can focus our efforts on the king's side. He goes b6. That's a weird move. I don't think that really does anything. That's not a King's Indian type of move. And that gives us basically free reign to attack on the king's side. There's many ways that we can go about attacking on the king's side. Um, there's a more positional approach to the king's side and a more tactical approach. The tactical approach is to go for his throat. Let's go g4, g5, try to open up the h file, checkmate him traditionally. I'll show you guys the more positional approach after the game, but we could also start by inducing a slightly awkward move. So we could play queen to d2 here, preparing to castle long in case we need to, but we don't need to rush with that. And obviously also attacking the h6 pawn, trying, trying to get him to go king h7, which could be a very vulnerable king later if the h file opens. Thank you, Churbaban, and eats, eats gummy worms. And now we're going to go for his throw, g4. Let's begin attacking. And because the center is closed, you guys might be looking at this with a little bit of confusion. How, are, how am I getting away with uh, pushing that, pushing these king side pawns. And now we need to defend this pawn, so we're gonna play f3. How am I getting away with all of this? Well, again, the center is closed. The rules are different when the center is closed. It's just not necessary to develop all of your pieces at once. Now we need to be careful about, in terms of how we attack. Because if we play g5 too early, if we play g5 here, which I'm sure a lot of you are tempted to play, He's going to blockade the whole attack by putting his knight on h5. We can take on h6. He drops his bishop back using that pawn as cover. That doesn't really accomplish anything. So 
we need to play in a little bit of a more crafty way. And in order to do that, we will need to complete our development. So can we complete our development? Is it even possible? Is there anywhere to put this knight? Well, there is. You can play knight h3. What is the knight doing there? Well, the knight's doing a lot of things on h3. It is supporting the move g5. Later on, it can leap to g5. That scenario can occur if this pawn disappears from h6. Maybe it will take on h6 and then play knight g5 check. Or you could sacrifice it on g5 in some variations. So the knight on h3 is doing a great deal of things. And if it ends up uh, interfering in our attack, we can always, in a very sameish like idea, we can play knight f2. Uh, and that knight is going to be a, a very good one. It's going to support e4. It's going to support g4. Uh, that's a perfectly serviceable knight. Okay. Now, once again, the question. I think he's trying to go king g8, evacuating his king from the immediate danger zone. Um... And that basically gives us one tempo to decide if we want to play g5 or not. If we're going to play g5, we should play it now. If we don't play g5, then we can sort of unhurriedly castle and prepare the second wave of attack. I don't see the need to go g5. I don't see the need to rush. On the other hand, if we don't rush and he evacuates his king, we might have a hard time um, getting the attack started again. Even if he runs his king to e8, he's not going to be out of the woods because we're going to be able to play f4. We're always going to be able to open up the center. So a case could be made either way, but let's do it. I want to see what happens. Let's go g5. This is a very double-edged move. I don't know if this is good or not, but we'll see how he reacts to this. I think a very professional move would be to take on g5, paradoxically enough. Now that he's prepared king g8, I think taking would be a good idea. And we might want to take with a bishop in order to pin his knight to his queen so that he doesn't jump around to h5 and other squares. Oh, it's all good. But but thanks. Knight g8, very passive move. Very passive move. And immediately that sends a signal to my head that his king on h7 is boxed in. The time has come for us to make things go boom. The time has come for us to make things go boom. So what does that even mean? Should we take on h6? Is that a good idea? Well, that's not a great idea. Then he can take with the knight and he'll have the g8 square again. This is a golden opportunity for us to make things go boom, go h5. I'm not even calculating this move. The worst thing that can happen is we lose a pawn. Big whoop, we lost a pawn. Look at how many files we are forcing open with this move. I smell a lot of stuff. I smell the g file being open. How can we occupy the g file in the fastest possible way? Obviously, rook g1 assuming uh, it's bad because it blunders the knight. What do we have in reserve? And this probably is going to be our next two moves. Yeah, we're going to castle. Then we're going to put this other rook on g1. And then we're going to have everything positioned perfectly on the, on the king side. Um, now, you don't need to panic when you reach. I see some players, they, they reach these positions. They do everything right. And then they somehow panic. Oh, you know, so much is going on. I don't know what's going on. You don't need to treat this as if this is some sort of, you know, you're, you're a, some sort of a molecular biologist performing an experiment. I mean, this is relatively simple position. There's a lot of tension going on, but let him be the one to take your pawns. You don't need to do anything. You just need to recapture the pieces that are being captured and bring more pieces into, into the attack. And when he decides to open up files or engage us, then we're going to react accordingly. You don't need to go crazy preliminarily because, you know, there's a lot going on. Okay, so if he takes on g5, we'll take back. If he takes on h5, we'll either take back or we'll just castle. The other thing to remember in such positions on that topic is that you don't always need to recapture. If he captures a pawn, maybe we'll decide to castle. Maybe we don't need to recapture the pawn. Maybe we don't want to waste a move. Maybe it's more important to bring more pieces in the attack. So that's another thing. You have to turn the autopilot off when you're attacking like this. When you're close to checkmate... Um, sometimes it's much more important to bring another rook into the attack than to restore material equality. Thank you, Zeus909 and OpenOB. But, yeah, so this is a great example of that. Goji takes h5. Taking on h5 is not a bad move. That opens up the h file. That actually seems quite appealing. But I would also argue at the same time where is this pawn going? Is he really going to defend this pawn in h5? Is that pawn going to run away from us? I mean, those are all rhetorical questions because the answer is clearly no. I think f4 is premature. I think f4 helps his bishop get open. 
I think we have a pretty clear developing move that we still need to play. What am I talking about? What is the move that we haven't played yet? It's clear to me that it's this particular piece is missing in the act, missing in action, the rook on a1. We need to involve the rook. Once we have two rooks in the attack, I feel like he won't have enough forces to defend. Yeah, we need to castle long. And uh, the situation on the ground for him is uh, critical. Because of how passive he is, he doesn't have any any active counterplay. Uh, which is which makes the King's Indian very hard to play. Um, if you don't get active counterplay, you're just going to get smothered. Which is what's happening here. Then, we can take on h5. We can play rook h1, rook g1. Depending on how he positions his pieces, we're going to choose our... Uh, Piece placement accordingly. Thank you, Mr. AU, for the prime. Appreciate it, of course. Well, I mean, castles is a patient move, but it's also a developing move. It's it's pretty natural, I think. You want your king to be safe when you're attacking. You don't want to keep thinking about, oh, what happens if the attack backfires? Yeah, rook g1 or rook h1, depending on what he does. Because either the g file might be the more important one. He goes king g6, so that gives us a clue about how to react. And it should be pretty obvious to you guys what, what we should do now. Whoa, Jam Jam with a 25. Damn, girl, it's Rook G1, of course. Damn, we got a lot of action in the house tonight. 25, my gosh. All right. Yeah, we're down a pawn. I think we'll resign now. <laughs> I think we'll resign now. No, King G6 was a panic move. Maybe he could have resisted a little bit better. But... um. I honestly don't think he had enough firepower there. Oh, I don't think he has enough firepower there. This is GG. Don't... Wait, I don't, I don't get the reference. F6 will play G takes H6 check and take the bishop. Okay, he goes back, which to his credit is the best move. To his credit, this is the best move. Now, how sh what should be the order of operations? Um... How should we, what should we do? It doesn't matter actually. Oh, his clock is frozen. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know why this happens. Um, sorry, let me just, all right, this should be good. Oh no, his clock is not frozen, it's 401. Yeah, so I would play rook h5. I mean, well, you can play g takes h6, but I'll show you guys after the game why it might be a good idea to keep the tension. Um, in general, again, notice how I'm not taking anything I don't need to take. I'm, I'm reserving all of my options because maybe I'll want to go G6. I mean, maybe he'll go F6 and I'll go G6 checkmate. This is not going anywhere. He's not going to defend the G pawn, uh, the H pawn that is. Furthermore, he might want to try to hide under the, um, shadow of the H pawn. So maybe we don't want to take it all. Maybe we want to hold this over. When in fact, I think we do. Now, let me think about this for a second. I actually want to calculate. This guy is incredibly resilient. I have to give him a lot of credit. He's tremendously resilient. Um, it's not that easy to finish off these attacks. Not at all. Yeah, time for us to open some more stuff up with F4. Let's go. F4, opening everything else up, trying to get his bishop out of the picture. Uh, just blasting the center. And I'll talk about other moves after the game. And this is a complex attack. I'm not going to pretend this is simple. Um, at the same time, I have two minutes left. I don't want to uh, sit around and lose on time. But now I think I found the winning idea. And the way that I found the winning idea is that I noticed that the queen on, t on d2, that's the missing piece. It's time to involve the queen. But the queen is boxed in by our own bishops. Can we get the queen involved efficiently with tempo forcing him to react to something while we involve our queen and this move otherwise would be very bad from a positional standpoint it's a terrible move we don't want to do this we take the knight we don't want to take the knight from a positional why are we opening up the b file for him the stark squared bishop is important but it's far more important for us to get our queen involved in the attack onto f4 so that it can attack f7 and threaten all these checkmates that's far more important than anything else in my opinion obviously maybe i'm wrong um Attacking is one of the hardest. Okay, but now he's blundered F7. And that was what I calculated. And what are we threatening in this position? And this is the unstoppable threat. This ends the attack. I'm... Okay, well, I didn't see how I could have finished it earlier, Akila. But I, I'm sure I didn't play accurately. That's for sure. 
Rook takes h6 is mate. I'm sure I didn't play entirely accurately. 100%. Um, it seems like I could have finished this earlier, but this just shows you how complicated attacking is. Yeah, Rook takes h6 is checkmate because he can't take with the king. It's defended. He can't take with the bishop because the bishop is pinned by the by the queen. Banakila, exactly. Nice. I'm pumped at that game. There's a lot to talk about. Um, so if you were a little bit overwhelmed uh, while the attack was going on, uh, now's the time to listen carefully because I'll try to explain the logic behind every attacking move. So we decided this game to play the Aberbeck, which is bishop b2 and bishop g5. And the landscape of the King's Indian is very vast. The landscape of the King's Indian is very vast. White has a million different lines. The main line, or the classical variation, is just to develop normally. Knight f3 and bishop b2, and as you guys have seen from my games, from my black games, castles, and then either knight c6 or ed4. So in this position, you've seen me go knight bd7, knight c6, knight a6. million different moves. Um, but in this game, we decided on the Aberbeck variation, bishop b2, bishop g5. Now, what is the idea of developing this bishop to g5? As I already explained, there are several ideas. First of all, this move can be thought of prophylactically. Um, I am actually preventing him from going e5. Can anybody tell me why? And I would be pretty impressed if somebody could figure this out. Um, if somebody could figure this out without having seen this line before. White to play. White is already winning. Or not winning, but white is much better. It's This is a bad move for black. And this is a trap that you could set... For, Kings, for inexperienced Kings Indian players, and they might fall into it. Okay. Yeah, knight d5 at the end is correct. Take everything, bishop f6 and knight d5. So takes, 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 takes. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. And I think the most accurate move order is to take first, then play knight d5, and you're forking f6 and c7. This looks like it wins on the spot. But black can play knight d7. Black can uh, limit the losses to a pawn. But in addition to everything else, black is going to be kind of paralyzed. The knight's going to have this outpost. So this is, uh, this is a disaster. A small-time disaster for black. So, um, so black has to make alternative arrangements. Knight d5 without bishop f6 is better. Yeah, see, embarrassingly, I don't even know. Yeah, apparently this is better. Uh, apparently this is the best move. Because if you, if you take on d5, you drop the exchange. Um, and so black has to make different arrangements, and there are many ways to do that. Black can move the queen out to e8. This is a very weird-looking move. This is actually the most popular move. The idea is to prepare e5. You are getting out of the pin, uh, and it, this move should make sense to everybody now. You just need to prepare e5. You can also say, all right, well, you're not going to let me play e5. I'm going to play c5, and I'm going to play this like a Benoni. This is also one of the more reputable lines, because the bishop on g5 could be misplaced in the Benoni. You could also play knight bd7. This is the old school move. This is what my opponent played. And the Aberbach was first played in 1930. Aberbach himself only played it uh, in the 50s. He was the most famous one to play it in the first, you know, 20, 30 years it was played. Thank you for the five months. Zoidbarf, appreciate it. So we decide on h4, which is a very tactical way to play the Aberbach. Um, queen d2 is the main move. Queen d2 is the main move. Um, I'm checking what Aberbach comes. Aberbach never faced knight bd7. Queen d2 has 2,000 games. h4 only 81 games, but it's been played by some GMs. Um, so you can see that I've never played the Aberbach with white, so I was experimenting too. And apparently the main line is queen d2, but it has a similar idea. I mean, you're trying to go bishop h6, so this is a pretty tactical line. You're trying to trade the king's Indian bishop, and eventually you might go h4, h5 e5, d5, knight c5, f3. So in many ways, this resembles the same-ish. I, I tried to avoid playing the same-ish, and look where we ended up. We ended up in a very similar position. So sorry about that. Um, so we played h4, and black played h6, which, let me see, out of the 81 games that featured the move h4, which I'm sure the computer laughs at, c5 is the main move. And uh, in the game, Albert against Benjamin, that was the highest rated game to reach this position. U.S. Championship 1983. So not a bunch of jokers. Lev Albert against, um, against Joel Benjamin, two very strong GMs. Um, C5, D5, B5, 
And Albert decided to play it like a Benko Gambit. And the reason for that is that white hasn't completed the king side development, and the king isn't really going to go to the king side because, well, now you have this H pawn sticking out. So playing it Benko Gambit style makes a lot of sense. And you'll you'll often see black doing this in the aver back. Um, Any, I don't want to bog ourselves down too much. I think H6 is fine. Bishop B3, I think he played fine. E5, D5, maybe white is a tiny bit better here. But this is where our opponent started going astray. This move B6 uh, is, a, is a very serious mistake. And when you play an opening like the King's Indian, you know, you get a reward, but you have to pay the entrance fee. The reward is that you're almost always going to get winning chances. You guarantee there's almost no lines in the King's Indian where white is able to force a draw. Not so, Queen's Gambit, Slav, white can play exchange Slav. Um, you know, Nimzo Indian, there's very peaceful positional lines. And the King's Indian, you almost always guarantee pretty tactical, complex struggle. On the flip side, if black plays a single inaccurate move, even an innocuous looking one, white's going to get that extra tempo and that potentially is going to be disastrous. Exchange King's Indian, yes, but you can side, you can sidestep the Exchange King's Indian. Uh, you, if you don't want to face the Exchange, you can play Knight BD7 first, and this transposes to the, uh, to the old main line, which is not considered to be amazing for black, but you can play this. Um, I've played it myself, and even in the Exchange, there are some lines where it's not a dead draw. Uh, black can definitely... Um, make attempts for the... Of course, white can make a draw if he's accurate, but that's basically true anywhere. Um, but anyways, b6 is a waste of time. I'm pretty sure that my opponent was afraid of going knight c5 because he didn't want to allow bishop c5 dc. He thought that this was a bad pawn structure, and I who can blame him for that? But it turns out that in the King's Indian, this type of trade, unless there are mitigating factors, is a disaster for white. It's a disaster for white because look at the dark squares. All these dark squares are now incredibly weak. Uh, there is nothing to attack h6 with. You can play queen d2, you're not threatening anything. And this d6 square, um, those of you familiar with basic positional ideas, how should black continue here? This is a classic idea. How should black continue in this position? The moment you see a square like this and a pawn like this, you know, you should kind of snap your fingers and think of the idea of going knight e8, knight d6. Um, trans transferring the knight to this very important blockading square. And that knight is going to be an amazing multitasker. You might prepare f5 if white castles kingside, or a6 and b5 if white castles queenside. I can show you right off the top of my head, I can show you games where I either had this kind of idea or I missed it, and I never forgot the lesson that I should have learned. That I, you know, I never forgot that I should have played it. Perhaps my most painful experience in this line uh, was in the World Youth Chess Championship in 2007, which, uh, which I won. And I only lost one game that tournament. And um, that game taught me this crucial lesson about transferring the knight to d6 in these types of positions. So if you're attentive to the lessons you learn from your losses, then you become better. This was the position um, where my coach literally yelled at me because I was 2100. I should have known this idea. Here, here you see the d5 pawn. This is a very King's Indian-like position. Very King's Indian-like. There's no pawn on c4. This was a perk. But the ideas are exactly the same. I should have gone here, and then here, and then here, and black is better. But instead, I thought, well, this pawn is annoying. Let me trade it off by playing c6. And obviously, well, this leads to a terrible pawn structure. This gives white a very big initiative. You can just see him leaping onto my position. The bishop on g7 is terrible, and I ended up losing. So I never forgot that, uh, forgot that lesson. I correctly understood that the pawn is annoying, but instead of blockading it, I tried to trade it. That benefited white entirely. All right. So I'm sorry to spend so long on this, um, on these moments. I think just this is pretty important for understanding the position. Okay. So b6 is a waste of time. This gives us an opportunity to develop the queen and begin the kingside attack. Begin to begin the kingside attack. Um, and after knight c5, we defend with f3. Notice that we do not. We do not take on c5 here under almost any circumstances. Note the word almost. So f3, a5, and now knight h3. So again, why didn't we play g5 immediately? Because after knight h5, uh, it's going to be very hard to make progress because of this blockading knight. g takes h6, bishop f6, and he's starting to attack this pawn. The knight can go on to f4 later. You guys should all kind of see that it's very, very difficult for white to get anything done now on the king side. So you can only go g5 once. Um, and when you go g5, you gotta make sure to make it count. 
So we decided to go knight h3, preparing g5, and rook h8 by our opponent, which I think is an okay move. I think it's interesting. And after g5, well, well, his knight is hanging. The problem is that his knight is hanging, so he has to respond to that. That's why, yes, if, if the knight wasn't on f6, he would have played h5. Um, and knight g8 was, I think, the decisive mistake. It's too passive. And not only is it too passive, but he allows us to play h5, ripping everything open, which, again, is is utterly disastrous. What should he have done? He should have gone knight h5, or g takes h, h takes g5, because here... I was planning to take on h6, and in contrast to the previous version, what additional move does white now have? And that's why we put the knight on h3. I explained this during the game. Knight g5 check. Yeah, and he, I mean, he, I guess he can play here, but then h7 is annoying. And if bishop g5, hg, and we get this incredibly strong protected passer. One could argue that the king is now safe. It is. But it's not like... White's only area of attack is the king side. You can you can also play on the king side in the center. You could prepare for white is pretty much dominating here. And very importantly, if he plays queen takes h4 check, I had to calculate this. We dropped the bishop back to f2, and now both of his pieces are hanging. So, um, uh, so so that had to be factored in, and that's why I think he should have taken on g5. Oh yeah, bishop takes h3. Who can tell me why this move is bad? Who can tell me why this move is bad? Yeah, g takes f6 with tempo. You attack both bishops at the same time. Rook takes h3, you're up a piece. And this only helps us open the h file. The king can just evacuate to c2. Well, it does a lot of things. It takes the knight. The knight's a good attacker, but it loses a piece. And after hg, knight g5, I would have castled. The game goes on. You can go knight h5 anyway. Black is okay here. Um, I would take white for sure. But I think black is fine. Uh, it's hard to continue the attack. So that should have been his appropriate reaction. But opening up the H file like this voluntarily is very difficult. And knight g8 is kind of tempting to curl up into a little ball. It just doesn't help him. So h5, bishop h3, rook h3, g h5. And as I explained in the game, we do not need to rush with recapturing this pawn. Um, and oh yeah, Tommy was asking about g takes h6 here. Because this kind of threatens checkmate. The problem is knight takes h6. And now if we give this check, we get a similar position to that other one. You could play like this. But in, in, in the context of this move being available, I just think this is a much more powerful attacking option. Um, so takes, 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 castles. King g6 is, you know, adds insult to injury. I don't know what he could have done here. I mean, look at how his knight is totally constrained by the pawn on g5. And taking that pawn helps us open files. So we play rook h5, uh, and then bishop g5, and this is totally crushing. Uh, so king g6 is understandable. And the hilarious thing is that if, you, if you're intimately acquainted with the greatest defensive efforts of Tigran Petrosian, you might laugh at the, con at the concept of moving the king to the center. But I had an entire lecture when I, when I was teaching uh, the Charlotte online camp last summer. Uh, to sort of very high-rated kids, 23, 2400. This year, the, the camp will be in person, so I might teach the same lesson. Uh, I talked about a really interesting defensive approach where when you think of defending against an attack on your king, the human instinct is to go into the corner. You're, you're tempted to go into the corner because it feels safest. And sometimes it is, but other times, the corner is the most confined place on the board. So it's much easier to checkmate the king in the corner. You don't need a lot of pieces, right? Smothered mate, you can checkmate with a single knight because the king is literally constrained by the sides of the board. And so a lecture was on certain positions where the best way to defend against a monster attack against your king is to move the king into the eye of the storm, to literally go into the center, uh, to either the center of the board or into the eye of the attack because the king has more escape scores. It's hard, it can it, it be easier to use other pieces to protect the king. Uh, this is all very concrete stuff. And one of the games that I showed um, in that lecture is a very memorable game for me, Kasparov Petrosian. Kasparov and Petrosian played a bunch of times, and Petrosian won the first two games against him, both from losing positions. So you can see Kasparov Petrosian, 1981. Kasparov was already 2630. Petrosian was in the final years of his life, but still incredibly strong. Thanks again, VP. That's incredibly generous. 
homeboy from SF. Um, sorry. Yeah, so look at, uh, look at this position and look at the attack against Black's King. Look at the attack against Black's King. Guys, guys, guys. Before asking if this was the same Tigran as, as was accused of cheating, look at the year that this game was played. 1981, that's 40 years ago. Does Tigran Petrosian, who was accused by, of cheating, strike you as being 70 years old or 65 years old? Uh, and do you think he played Kasparov and Tilburg in 1981? Nah. Um, yes, you're like, yep. He's basically a time traveler. Tigran Petrosian is not alive. He died in 1985. I believe, of, of cancer, unfortunately, in his 50s. Uh, very premature death. Um, Sag. So, basically, in this position, he's under monster attack. Absolute monster attack. So let's look at the attack. The rooks on perfect files. The queen aiming at the king. Every single one of white's pieces is in the attack. Every single one. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a six-piece attack. You don't see this every day. Black has nothing going for him. No activity. The only thing that Black even has is an extra pawn. One extra pawn to compensate for the most monstrous attack of all time. So Kasparov is, is winning here. Obviously, White is pretty much completely winning. But Petrosian turns this around in the span of two moves. Span of two moves. Now, the first thing Petrosian does is he plays the move rook to a8. He tries to hold together the a6 pawn. Um, sort of out of desperation, he tries to make sure that there's no sacrifice on a6 because that was being threatened. And Gary, in time pressure, plays a very tempting move. Gary plays the move queen to b1. This turns out to be a very big mistake. Um, and this mistake, believe it or not, relinquishes the advantage. Now, the purpose behind queen b1 is quite straightforward. Gary wants to sacrifice on b5 and deliver... Wait, yeah, and, but, and deliver uh, checkmate. Okay, so basically, why is this made? Because after knight b6, um, I don't have the analysis on hand. So maybe this is premature for white. Knight a5, rook a5. Yeah, I guess this is okay for white. Um, it's all good. Yeah, we, got a, we had a small spoiler, but I was going to show it anyway in a second, so don't worry about it. Um, so I guess Kasparov was sort of preparing a potential sacrifice. Maybe he was trying to sacrifice on a6 here. Anyways, the attack is horrendous. And uh, I think the human instinct would be to sort of tuck your king away in the corner. But you'll quickly realize that none of this would work. Rook takes b5. This is crushing. And uh, as you guys probably know by now, Kasparov play or Petrosian played king c6. Uh, absolutely insane move. King, let me just control z a bunch of times so I can see the game score. King c6. The king goes right into the eye of the storm, except it doesn't because the rooks are on A and B, uh, are on A2 and B3, and now they look stupid. There's nothing on the C file, so the king is relatively safest on C6. According to Kasparov, he was he almost fell out of his chair when he when he saw this move played, but it makes sense. Um, and the king itself actively participates in the defense by attacking this bishop. This bishop was one of the big issues in Black's position, and Petrosian literally threatens to take on D6. And Kasparov immediately collapses. He blunders a piece. Kasparov goes rook b to a3. And one of the things Kasparov forgot about is that king c6 not only attacks the bishop, that's what Kasparov was trying to defend against, bishop d6. There's rook a6 check, and we have a skewer. But Kasparov forgot that the knight can now be captured by the pawn. The king has unpinned itself from the queen. And after rook a6, rook a6, rook a6, this isn't checkmate. You just go bishop b6, the king is safe. And black is a piece up. The game is over. Um, the game is over. And, and Petrosian easily defended queen to d8. Take twice on c5. The king now on c5. And Kasparov, after playing rook a4, resigned without awaiting Petrosian's response. Because now he has virtually no compensation. The attack has fizzled out. Petrosian has a million ways to win. Um, and, uh, and this was a stunner. You know, king b5 even, I would say, uh, probably wins the game. So... Why not bishop takes c7 followed by knight d6? Yeah, so why did I assume you mean here? Well, bishop c7, there would be king c7. Um, bishop c7, king c7. That was one of the ideas of rook a8 because now the a6 pawn is defended by the rook. So 
Yeah, exactly. Kasparov would have just quit chess immediately, and then he would have never become world champion. So the bottom line is that king g6, these kinds of moves can be good, except in this case, the king walks into an open file, rook g1. But that's the only reason that, uh, that in this case, this move was bad. He, to his credit, he walked back to g7, rook h5, knight e7. Here, I think I probably should have just taken on h6. Uh, but after bishop f6, I couldn't quite find uh, the decisive move. That, again, it's the umbrella method, the king using the pawn as an umbrella. Thank you for the five. Hey, it's Cap and Ishmeister. I can't keep up with the subs today. Hey, it's Cap with the five subs. Damn girl is right. Wow. Okay, lots of support today. Bishop g5, I'll take it. Queen takes g5, I'll go knight g6, and I'll shut down the g-file. So, and now the knight can go to f4 later. So you gotta be careful, man, with six. Stop him, and you did not have to do that. You are always a welcome presence in the chat. Please don't worry about that, but thank you for the six subs. Min is literally, I feel, this is, I'm getting mega spoiled right now. I see what you're trying to set up to, five, six. Um, I don't suppose we have a um, seven. You are never, I don't want to see that. Oh, seven, we do. Dr. Lord Mayonnaise of the seven. See, I pressured him into that. We got a seven, Dr. Lord Mayonnaise. Thank you. Um, oh my gosh, this is getting crazy. Uh, I, I like how we just uh, spontaneously uh, were able to manufacture this. So um, thank you, Dr. Lord Mayonnaise. Thank you, Min. Thank you, hey, it's Cap. Much appreciated. Um, so back to the game. Before I was really interrupted. Basically, uh-oh. I knew the eight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh my god. I'm, I'm in disbelief right now. Yeah, bang. I need a gavel. I need, I need to bang something. So, um, back to the game. And I can't, I can't seem to analyze a single move. So the reason we played f4 is to open up more files and diagonals for our pieces. And after e takes f4, um, came the moment at which we violated all of the rules of the position in order to involve our queen in the attack. Bishop takes c5. He has to react to that. He has to take the piece back and we play queen takes f4. Um, somebody's, going to, somebody's going to give in. <laughs> somebody's going to give in. Oh God, I see, I see, I see. Um, and the, and the, the queen is of course now involved in the attack. Uh, so in this position, I, I, I realized that um, my opponent could have gone, no, I think black is just lost, but maybe he can go rook f8. Somehow rook f8 uh, holds things together, gh, oh no, it doesn't, gh, bishop h8, and now it seems like maybe the king is hiding under the pawn, but how should white uh, finish the attack here? This is a very classic combination, very classic idea. Um, uh oh, we got nine. B Town Pro. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, Rook G7 is correct. Rook G7, H7, Queen H6, Queen H8. Um, I am in disbelief. We got a $3 dono from NJ Drizzt. Uh, yeah, well, we can't, come, we can't come this far. Yeah, exactly. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. So this was winning. Queen f4, knight, knight g6, queen f7, and rook h6 is mate. This was a nice attack. I mean, I think there was nothing extraordinary here. Um, we also could have even done queen takes g6 check, which is kind of funny. King g6, gh check. Uh, and this is winning. King f6, rook f5, or king f7, rook g7. But there was completely unnecessary. <laughs> rook h6 is mate. Oh, we got 10. Hey, it's cap with the 10. Oh my god, that is just ridiculous. This is a serious sequence here. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Are you kidding? No, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Are you kidding me? Uh, Wabika, was there any light squared bishop action? Yeah, you could have tried e5 here and open up this diagonal, something like this, but I already saw the possibility of involving the queen, so this just seems like a better, more straightforward option, uh, if that makes sense. And if necessary, we can play e5, bishop d3 here. So any questions about the game? I know there's a lot of excitement here, but I got to do my job. Um, I really appreciate it. Anybody have any questions about this game? Um, anywhere along? 
What about Queen F8 here? Well, still G takes H6, I think. Um, and after Bishop E5, I mean, I think we can find a mate. It takes, and this is all crushing. Uh, maybe we'd have to be a little bit more careful here. Well, it's not my birthday, but we can pretend it is. How can Black compensate the lack of development on the quail? He couldn't. That's yeah, that's why he should have played Knight C5. Um, this is all on YouTube, yes. Why not play Bishop D4 to trade the bishop instead of taking the knight? Uh, because we took the knight in order to involve the queen. Bishop D4 I considered. I considered Bishop D4, thank you for the 100 bits. But I figured that involving the queen would be more efficient. Knight G6 here, maybe he can play. And if you're not careful in such situations, the attack can fizzle out quickly. That's one of the problems with attacking against good defenders is that good defenders are not going to give you infinite chances. You have to be precise. You have to be precise. Okay, looks like we're all clear. Would letting him take the bishop on g5 to open the h file immediately? Um, I don't know. I don't know when you mean. Uh, you mean here? Yeah. Uh, no, premature, premature. You mean just like going something random to open the H file? Premature. Because uh, we're not going to be able to get a queen here or a queen here fast enough. And sacrificing a piece is just a little bit of a too high of a price to pay. But that's a good thing. I mean, you always have to consider those things. 